Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Conforti, and I was director here from uh, 1994 to 2015, and worked with Ando on this project, so it's a great pleasure to be able to um, commemorate the opening of, of Ando's Clark Center uh, and this re renovated campus that you'll hear so much about today. Uh, and of course, it's also the, um, uh, the 10th anniversary of the uh, of Annabelle Seldorf, similarly successful transformation of the original Clark Museum building. Uh, but as her work continued here for a few more years until 2016, when she in her ever brilliant fashion finished the renovation of the Manton Research Center, uh, I'm gonna concentrate today on, um, on the expansion component of the project, which one which began when Ando was chosen as design architect in 2001, a project that, that continued for the next, low be it, 13 years, with Annabelle joining in 2007. Now, as many of you are well aware, um, uh, we're, we're lucky to have engaged one of the world's most recognized architects. And, and while Anna was already acclaimed when we commissioned him with extraordinary works the world over, even um, famously on the island of Naoshima in Japan's Inland Sea, many commissions there that began in 1990. Since our project, he seems to have reached an, another level even of recognition uh, with commissions uh, from uh, Francois Pino in Venice, and I show you here the 2009 Punta della Dogana uh, and the later renovation of the 16th century uh, Palazzo Grassi, which he also added to with this little theater, which you see here. Um, is that working? Yes, the theater, we, 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 which you see here. Uh, uh, there's also the Pinot Commission galleries um, uh, created within the former Paris Stock Exchange, uh, finished four years ago, and there is too his current project uh, for the much-loved Krolle Müller Museum in the town of Otterloo in the Netherlands, um, an even more rural site than uh, Williamstown. Uh, <laughs> and not to mention, um, the publicity he received a few months ago uh, when Beyonce and Jay-Z, this is the most important thing, uh, bought uh, Bill Bell's 19, uh, 2015 house on the Malibu coast, paying $200 million or 190, uh, some say, uh, more than, but in either case, more than any other house ever sold in California. Uh, and even more uh, recently, uh, there has been news in the New Yorker of Yee, formerly Kanye West's um, pilloried renovation of another Ando house on the Malibu coast. Social media devoted late millennials and even and Gen Zs have been attracted to all of this um, uh, with Ando often glibly cited as, quote, the world's greatest architect. So uh, with all this um, notoriety, making him one of the so-called star architects of our era, I suppose I could um, speak personally on the subject that critics of art museum expansions have re re regularly verbalized, and uh, the often referenced um, and assumed egotism of art museum directors who <laughs> supposedly want to establish their reputations by commissioning uh, museum buildings from such stars, projects that are seen as often uh, unnecessary to those same uh, critics. But it may not surprise you that I'm going to let that question gestate a bit <laughs> as I concentrate on something else, and they need something a bit more effortful, a bit less fun, admittedly, uh, and that is the special challenges of the Clark site and of connecting past architecture with later programmatic and infrastructure needs, problems that I hoped Ando would, would resolve here. In doing so for this clock, uh, for this talk that's being recorded, actually, uh, as part of the Clark's oral history project overseen by Colin Torre and whose help in finding so many of the images I'm about to show you has been invaluable, so I thank him. Um, in uh, deflecting from Star Talk uh, to this so-called story of program and physical growth amid the restrictions of previous architecture story, I'll reference uh, some of the other issues this project faced over the years. Fundraising on the one hand, um, a plethora of uh, regulatory restrictions stemming from, among other things, being next to a pond, uh, as well as various community uh, concerns always present when an institution expands, but which in our case grew to a period of controversy, 
also not totally uncommon uh, with, uh, with public architectural projects. And I'm going to do all of this in the context of, as I said, uh, the history of the Clark's architecture and, and its residential street location, a history that I believe helps us better understand uh, the architecture and site challenges as they have presented themselves from the time of Clark's uh, conception in the 1950s to the project that we're uh, com uh, commemorating today. Before I begin, however, um, I, I, really another word, uh, I want to emphasize <laughs> that these various challenges that I cite should really be forgotten uh, after this talk is all over. Um, messiness of conception and creation is part of any architectural project, and the results after uh, dealing with such messiness are what matter, and today it's clear that the Clark enjoys a functional as well as a tranquil, if not to say inspiring, series of indoor and outdoor spaces for which Ando and his team and the many others involved uh, are, are responsible landscape and buildings that seem to fit seamlessly into the site and which continue to be made by Olivier and the Clark staff as Ando and his many collaborators would have wanted. Crisp and alive, giving no reason to remember any of the detail that, uh, that I'm about to put to you in this talk. So, um, I'm gonna start my remarks by reminding you of the extraordinary serendipity of circumstances that accompany the founding of the Clark. It's both fun to recollect, but it's also central to the story of the specialness of this site and what this site has represented from the beginning. Uh, briefly said, Sterling Clark was an inveterate collector, but he, but not one to particularly care a great deal about institutions, and that even extended to the institution for his own collection. Always armed with faithful lawyers and business associates to guide him in his affairs, it was they who seemed to have been more concerned about his collection's future than he was. With no direct heirs except a stepdaughter resident in Paris, his advisors had encouraged him uh, to consider various organizations to accept his collection on his death. Once in the 1930s, it was to be the Petit Palais in Paris, where he lived much of the time but being forced back to the U.S. to reside exclusively here in the wake of World War II, he considered the city of Richmond, where his Upperville, Virginia neighbor, Paul Mellon, had established ties. He then drafted a will um, in 1943, which left the entire collection to the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But within a couple of years of that act, he had bought a couple of townhouses at 72nd and Park Avenue next to his apartment at 740 Park, and he began to develop plans to renovate them for a museum. In, 1990, in 1947, however, uh, the fear of war made him think otherwise. Um, more than any other American collector, war had been a regular condition in his life. He had an early career as an army officer in the Boxer Rebellion in China, as you see here, and he stayed in Paris during World War I, uh, even helping in the war effort, and as I said, he was forced to leave Paris uh, and, and the house which you see here at the start of World War II. So in the wake of the horrific atomic bomb, bomb, attack, uh, bomb, attack, and, uh, bomb attack in 1945, he told friends he was considering the idea of establishing a museum in, quote, Upper New York State or even the Berkshires coming back to a notion that he, and, uh, he had decades before when he and his brother Stephen were getting along a bit better uh, of building museum near family houses in Cooperstown, New York. There was no evidence um, that he was at first particularly conscious uh, by the fact that his grandfather, Isaac Singer's lawyer, who had become Singer, the Singer Sewing Machine Company's business visionary and controlling partner, the fact that his grandfather had gone to Williams, had been a trustee of the college, as has his, fa as has his, his father, and that his grandfather had established a collection of geological specimens along with the gift of $100,000, a lot of money in the 1880s, for a building on the campus finished in 18... 1889, which you see here, which was subsequently torn down. Nor was he probably particularly conscious uh, that his mother and he and his siblings had given funds for another Clark Hall completed in 1908, uh, designated with a plaque, plaque that, that, um, that referenced uh, his, um, uh, the, the fact that he, he was a donor and one of the grandsons of, of Edward Clark. Instead, it seems to have been a Williams alumnus named William Sidley 
who was told of the availability of an important collection of paintings through an acquaintance who handles some of Clark's legal and business affairs, a guy called Thomas Roberts. Sidley, in turn, contacted the founding head of the Williams Art History Department, uh, Carl Weston, who with his student and fellow professor, uh, Elaine Faison, went to New York to see the collection. And they were so deeply impressed that they advised the then uh, Williams president, uh, Finney Baxter, to invite Clark to, to Williamstown. A dinner at the president's house in September 1949 with Clark Hall an easy sight from Baxter's dining room across Main Street seems to have given the relationship a special start. And after that dinner, um, discussions pr progress rapidly, but it seems from the surviving records that the, the issue, issue of finding a site for the potential museum was more an agenda item for Baxter than for Clark. Clark spending far more time discussing mutual interests in French and American history uh, than in the project itself. After that dinner, though, finding a, a museum site for, became Baxter's passion for a few months, with Clark himself wanting a separate institution and not one under the college's oversight as the college had offered. Uh, and with all the land available in Williamstown in circa 1950, including what could have been a Valhalla Getty-like site, which you see here, or a Mount Hope-type site, or a Field Farm-type site, you might ask why residential South Street was targeted. Baxter seems to have been conscious that the future museum, while charted separately from the college, would or should one day be linked to college activity and walking distance of the campus, what's set in his mind from the beginning. Over the three months after that September 1949 dinner, Baxter negotiated with various owners with no immediate avail um, until uh, he was able to arrange for Clark to purchase a house recently bought by the retiring college treasurer, Charles Bakepiece, from the Vanderbilt Adrians family. Uh, by February 1950, with Baxter arranging for the Makepieces to have lifetime use of the house that's now the Oakley Center, a sale to, the, to Clark could proceed. A charter for the new institute was drawn up and signed on March 14th, 1950, a breathtaking six short months from the time Clark had that first dinner in Williamstown. Clark soon, um, uh, Clark soon asked who owned the land uh, surrounding the property to the rear, and to protect the museum from future residential growth, he purchased the more than 100 acres of upland fields and woods from the same Adrian's family who had owned the Makepeace House. Thus, the Clark Art Institute began its life with a narrow frontage on a residential street in this college town, with land in the, in the rear that was acquired so that no houses could look down on the museum at any point in the future. After two years of design by the Long Island architect Daniel Perry with various early unexecuted configurations as you see here, and with the Adrian's house being um, used as uh, construction offices before being torn down as you see in the front, a groundbreaking took place in 1952 and the museum was completed and opened in a modest ceremony in May 1955. As President Baxter exclaimed at that ceremony, the Institute will put the community on the art map of the world and in the same way that the Huntington Library and Art Collection in San Marino in California have put Pasadena on the map, um, it will mean a great deal to the community and to the college and bring a lot of tourist traffic as the Huntington Library has done. Sterling and Francine lived in the rear of the building um, in the months before the opening in order to be closer to the installation of their treasures now being put together for the first time in their lives. Some having been displayed, some stored in a couple of apartments in New York. The art from the Paris house kept in storage in Montreal after that house was closed in the late 1930s. It had to have been a special experience for them to see them all here uh, put together. But the museum had only been open for 18 months when Clark passed away in December 1956. Under the directorship of Peter Gill, a former silver dealer trusted by Clark, the, the Institute was governed by a board of trustees, each of whom had been one of Clark's legal and bi or business advisors. It grew decently enough in the first years of existence, 31,000 uh, visitors in 56, 
to 51,059, this previously unknown former private collection now open to all and people were curious. The Clark's future would change markedly in the 1960s, however, and it's a decade that should be considered the most important in the Institute's relatively short history, culminating with its first and arguably most important expansion, the now named Manton Research Center, which we're in. Francine Clark had chosen to live in New York after Sterling's passing, though visiting the museum on a number of uh, occasions. And with her own death in April 1960, the Clark gained an endowment which totaled approximately $25 million, the purchasing power of about $250 million today. That same year, 1960, the Robert Sterling Clark uh, professorship was established at Williams College with a gift of $500,000, about $4 million um, purchasing power today, a gift made directly to the college by the separate New York-based Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, a grant-making agency Clark's, Clark's advisors had encouraged him to establish, and one which, which Clark had written that he hoped would uh, eventually support his, his institute. With the prospect of eminent art historians um, uh, coming regularly to Williamstown um, as annual Clark professors, the college began to be concerned that their lecture facilities would not be substantial enough. And it was expressed here in a letter. Um, you see it here in a letter from, uh, to, um, to, to Baxter from Whitney Starter, the then director of the uh, College Museum, whom, whom you see on the left with uh, Professor Bill Pearson on the right. The need for a large lecture hall, as well as other needs, um, garnered the, uh, the uh, guarded the generation of the first idea of, the Clark, of a Clark expansion, one that, um, uh, one that was sketched by architect Perry in 1960, just to the south on the side of, site of another house, the so-called Griswold House. There's the Griswold House here, and it would have been torn down. They, they bought it right after um, they opened the building, and the lecture hall is here. It would have extended off, uh, and you see how it would have been extended from the, the original Clark Building uh, here. Um, uh, it was decided, however, that mechanical equipment for, for such a future addition that necessitated a service structure, thus a supporting um, building, which would forever be called the maintenance building, was designed by Perry and built between the museum and the upland Oak Ridge, acreage bought by Clark. With construction beginning in 1962, it was highly functional, including an underground passage, which you see here, um, the, that went uh, directly in, in, into the, uh, the structure. But it also the building also ensured that would be a front as well as a back to the campus, sealing off the Clark's museum visitors from the upland acreage, its trails and views, while not threatening as access for college and townspeople. Just as Mr. Adrian's the former owner, and now the Clark would allow, uh, all, uh, and all of this fostered a sense of community rights of ownership that would continue for decades to come. Besides the large endowment made available by Francine's passing in 1960, and the significant growth a gift from the Clark Foundation, establishing the Clark Professor in the same year, the 60s decade was uh, made more consequential with the 1961 appointment of John Jack, called Jack Sawyer, as president of Williams. Uh, as president and soon to be Clark trustee, uh, Sawyer would follow and even exceed Baxter in making the fledgling museum function in a way that would support the college's goals. With the advice of the earliest Clark professors who had also started to arrive in 1961, the noted connoisseur John Pope Hennessy here being the first, followed by some of the most eminent art historians of that era. Uh, Ellis Waterhouse you see here, Jakob Rosenberg, Wolfgang Steckau, Sherman Lee, Julius Held, uh, Egbert Avagam Begman here would even write a catalog of the Clark's drawings collection. And they all set a scholarly tone for the new enterprise as they also advised on the existing collection and its future given that future acquisitions were now possible uh, due to the institute's, institution's large endowment. American museum professionals were also brought in, some of whom suggested a more aggressive public focus. 
Sawyer, however, um, along with the Clark trustee and future board chair Talcott Banks, felt that the institute should instead enhance the assumptions that Clark had been encouraged to state in the museum's 1950 charter to engage or assist educational activities, teaching, and research, uh, quotes. And to further realize these goals, in September 1962, Banks presented a memorandum to the board outlining a proposed Center for Graduate Study, which was followed a month later uh, on, uh, by the Clark Foundation presenting a check for $50,000 to begin an art history library, the first ingredients that Banks and Sawyer felt were necessary to initiate such a graduate program. Well, one, and that program would be sponsored by the Clark and Williams College, resulting in the Clark's enhanced mission being now both uh, an art museum as well as a center for higher education. In 1964, they, um, uh, they encouraged uh, the, the noted scholar George Hurd Hamilton, who had been a neighbor of Sawyer's in New Haven, to be both a curator at, as, at the Institute as well as the f head of the future graduate program through a joint appointment from Williams and the Clark. In agreeing to come in June 1966, he also became the Clark's director, successfully requesting at the same time that the board uh, alter its then policy of no outgoing loans from the collection to enable participation in temporary exhibitions nationally. The growing library under the um, oversight of Michael Reinhardt attracted from Florence's uh, Itati and, and London's Cortal Institute by the library's acquisition uh, potential would find its first home in the maintenance building. Uh, before any new structure was, was to be built. That ever useful maintenance, maintenance building space would later be the site of the first graduate classes before the now Manton Research Center was finished. And later in the mid 1970s, it became home of the Clark and National Endowment for the Arts sponsored Regional Conservation Center, now the independent Williamstown Art Conservation Center. And I should say for, the, for those in town, um, this is indeed Williamstown's uh, Paul Reinhardt of the spoke to, to, to the left of his father. But uh, by the middle of um, 1965 then, with its pro uh, projected staff in place and new programs envisioned, the board realized it would need to return to that 1960 plan for physical expansion, but this time with a more substantial list of needs than, than were outlined five years before. In early 1966, Banks uh, chose Pietro Belusky, the former dean at MIT, as architect of the new facility. And Belusky would work with Norman Fletcher the, of the Cambridge firm of the Ar Architects Collaborative, or TAC as it was known, to realize the, the project. An open court would connect to an expansive library. Separate galleries would be built for temporary exhibitions from the permanent collection. Uh, adjacent to, but not connected to one another, one for silver, one for prints and drawings, the other for paintings. Banks's oversight with um, uh, oversight of the building program and his perceived need for a chamber music hall in the Berkshires, as he also served as board chair of the Boston Symphony in Tanglewood, resulted in this special acoustically outstanding lecture and performing arts space in the, the new building the wonderful space that we are in now, the drawing for which you see here. Now, regular gifts to support the library uh, continued to be made from the Clark Foundation, but in October 1967, it also awarded $300,000 towards uh, the new building. When what then became known as the 1973 building was finished, uh, it had successfully linked an open courtyard to a generous, light-filled, and seminar in, in the space, uh, in, uh, seminar space in the stacks, enhanced library, as you see here, connecting to galleries and to offices, as well as to this uh, wonderful uh, large-scale lecture and concert, concert hall, all articulated in the quasi-brutalist ar architectural vocabulary of the time, contrasting with the classicism of the original building. Given the narrowness of the site, however, um, uh, the new addition required an urban style um, uh, drive under a connecting bridge necessary to access the visitor parking behind. A somewhat odd arrival element uh, in such a quasi-rural Berkshire site. 
and one that further enshrined the front and back quality to the campus, which the maintenance building had begun. And this would be the parking arrangement for the next three decades. Two of those decades, from the mid-70s to the mid-90s, were marked by a nearly debilitating condition of a program restraint that coincided with the opening of the 73 building. No money had been attempted to be raised, no money had been attempted to be raised outside of the Clark Foundation gift already mentioned, it be being assumed that the endowment would cover the remaining costs. And this might have been fine uh, uh, if the stock market hadn't lost almost half its value in the two years after the building opened. As some of you may remember have heard the, this dramatic mid-70s stock market fall contributed to, to one of the worst inflationary periods in the country's history, lasting to the early 1980s. Early on in this period, the Clark's trustees enforced a tight drawdown of around 3% of, on the Institute's decreased endowment, a condition that remained through the remainder of George Heard Hamilton's a, a, a directorship and that of his successor, David Brooke, who, who succeeded him in 1977. Though no architectural projects were undertaken during this period, that is not part of our story, a great deal managed to be accomplished during these two decades in spite of the fact uh, that, that low drawdown rate remained more or less unchanged even after the markets and the economy had approved in the later 1980s and early 1990s, the time when a search began for David Brooks' successor. Given these tight drawdown restrictions and the more positive economic climate of from the mid 80s to the early 90s, the value of the endowment improved significantly enough so that in the early months of 1994, when I was in discussion with the, with the Clark trustees regarding becoming director, the Institute was in the schematic design phase of a small capital project to expand storage facilities of the library with, with underground compact shelving. The Clark Todd History Library had become one of the most significant in the, in the country, and around 1990, earlier, the trustees had adopted a plan for the Institute's future, and it was a plan that centered on the better use of this extraordinary resource. I understood this and was committed to it, but in my negotiation, I asked for an enhancement to the construction program to provide more public space as well. And with the help of the Boston-based Boston and Bay Associates who were designing the library's underground edition, we, we proposed an enclosure um, f uh, to an open courtyard. And you see that courtyard as it was open here um, and how it uh, ended up uh, uh, above. And it, was, uh, and it was an enclosure that would uh, provide three things. It would uh, uh, provide better circulation for temporary exhibitions, at the upper level and in, in enlarging the exhibition space at the same time while creating an enclosed uh, summer cafe and off-season small lecture room in space that has since been transformed into the Manton uh, Study Center, all with the addition of, um, of office space uh, down, uh, down below. Um, this was done with the hope that larger and more significant self-organized exhibitions might contribute to the field and, uh, and potentially expand the cultural tourist audience, especially in the summer, providing those audiences with all-weather food service and offices for any staff that might be, as well as the offices for any staff that might be needed in the future. Now, it is important to note that everyone, including myself, that thought, thought that this was expansion that was finished in 1996 would fulfill the Institute's needs for years to come. But circumstances occurred that put a future expansion plan on the Clark's agenda sooner than anyone had assumed. On the one hand, the enhanced ex exhibition spaces, not particularly ex 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 expansive, allowed for just enough additional space to encourage curators to think more creatively and expansively in, in planning exhibitions. And while the new wing uh, opened in the summer of 1996 with a permanent collection exhibition focused on the Clark's Renoirs. Perfectly nice, but something we could organize without much planning as we didn't have much time. The, the next year's John Singer Sargent Show gathered extraordinary works of art from European and American collections to an unanticipated critical and popular success, all under the curatorial oversight of Mark Simpson. 
This began a series of exhibitions that uh, increased audiences in the summer, as well as in the so-called shoulder seasons. Although I have to say that uh, the, the, they were popular uh, and critically and publicly, but they don't uh, in any way, uh, they didn't in any way make, make as significant a scholarly contribution as the uh, amazingly researched monographic show on Letty are currently on view. Now these exhibitions also challenge the, the infrastructure, particularly the, uh, the open to the loading air or loading dock facility of the original 55 building that began to be noticed uh, as, as less than secure to the many of the potential lenders of works of art that we're trying to attract. And you see here, it here about to be torn down. Uh, the once eloquent and tranquil courtyard of the 73 building was now being used for uh, expanded visitor services, tickets, shop, and seating, as well as events. Um, and so by 1997, 98 and beyond, um, with the Sargent Show and the others being planned for the future, we began to realize that seasonal visitors were actually coming to Williamstown in larger numbers and would further strain orientation, dining, and retail facilities. At the same time, and remembering the trustee directive to enhance the use of the library, focused as it had been largely on Williams' student and faculty use up till that time, the Clark made a commitment to advance critical dialogue within the field of art history, appointing first John O'Neill's and shortly after Michael Ann Hawley, pictured here, to a newly created position of director of research and academic program. And they would initiate a series, uh, a new guest scholar initiative, and Michael Ann herself would launch a series of symposia and colloquia to expand and deepen discussions in the visual arts a program that quickly became, began to be recognized internationally. Scholars soon competed to come to Williamstown to use the library and stay in the desirable large apartments uh, John O'Neill's had recommended uh, the, the Clark, uh, the, the, uh, in this house that the Clark renovated and expanding across the road that was bought in 1998, finished in 2000, designed by Tom Hotelling of Ann Bay Associates. The programmatic expansion was, not po was possible not because of fundraising efforts. The Clark um, had no development office and its membership program had no more than two people who were giving at, at a level of $1,000 a year in 1994. The Institute was lucky, however, I was lucky, that we all were lucky, that the late 1990s was not only a buoyant time in the stock market, um, the board's finance committee, led by Jim Moltz, agreed to change the circa 3% drawdown on the endowment that had been in place since the 1970s to a more common industry standard of for, uh, around 4.5%, creating the, all of which created income that enabled the expansion of program and staff without the need to raise funds to enable such initiatives. None of this, however, the new audiences for energized exhibitions we staged nor the enhanced research and academic program would have themselves driven the need for new facilities immediately. Indeed, the most uh, significant catalyst was when in late 1996, only five months after the opening of the Ambea designed expansion, the, this independent Williamstown Art Conservation Center in our maintenance building announced that it had received a $500,000 grant from the Kresge Foundation to expand its facilities in the maintenance building. There actually had been a, uh, an addition uh, to that uh, building, a so-called Butler building um, that was done in the, 19, uh, in, in, in the 1980s. So there was no reason for the on the conservation's part, uh, part to think that, there, that any further expansion would be a problem for the Clark. Through in fact, through 1997 and 1998, um, the center and the Clark worked together on a plan to expand that maintenance building with um, with the proposed, uh, two proposed little additions, providing a new loading dock for the Clark. Here, here it was originally, a new loading dock on the side of the Clark, and then the expanded uh, conservation center uh, up, um, up here. Um, I participated in this functional goal planning, but pr pretty quickly began to worry that if a new facility were to be built, that, it, that itself might affect what the in institute could ever do on the Clark campus in the future. 
We needed, in my view, a master plan for the future of the campus before a shovel was put into place for such a pro project. And it was a contentious time, not only because the Clark was preventing the immediate application of that grant for, for the Conservation Center's growth, but having assumed that the 1996 expansion would be sufficient for years to come, the Clark Board was understa understandably skeptical of any proposed plan involving a future uh, building program. However, in uh, December 1998, two years after the center had been the, uh, had notified the Clark of their grant for new facilities, the Clark Board met in Los Angeles at the newly opened and our sometimes library partner Getty Center and Museum, and we decided to visit uh, the, the Huntington um, uh, and see what a private collection gone public on 200 acres of land could be uh, that impressed all of us and um, uh, and board president Frank Oakley subsequently led the trustees in supporting further study and a master planning process was carried out in 1999 by the Boston firm of Machado and Silvetti who were then working on uh, the uh, uh, renovating and expanding the, the, the Getty Villa, the original uh, Getty uh, Museum. Machado and Silvetti's master plan was very helpful for us in realizing what could be done on the campus, but they chose to confine their work to the existing complex and all, all of which around the here and not extending, um, not extending to our then 130 acres, um, uh, both for, for, uh, on the one hand for longer term growth and for vi visitor access to the upper trails and their spectacular views, something that I'd begun to take on as, as, a, as an ambition. In early 2000, we then commissioned um, Cooper Robertson Associates in New York to consider the entire campus in an expanded planning exercise. Theirs was completed in 2001 and included locations for future buildings on an, uh, on, on an uphill slope, uh, as you see up here. Um, uh, 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 and, and they also include the possible integration of a pond. And here you see that pond next to the Clark with a access, not assuming that we owned that land, and here with access, assuming we, we own that land. And, that, and it was, uh, it was um, and it w there was a question about who, whether we would ever own that land. It was owned by the Wall family. Uh, and while the pond was uh, only a few yards away from the museum building and in the Clark Gallery's view shed, it had never been part of the Clark property. And, uh, the importance of that uh, view shed was already, uh, it already encouraged the board to begin discussions a couple of years earlier. But it was then, around 2000, that it was finally bought um, and, uh, and we in, in incorporated the adjoining five acres and pond along with the house with lifetime interest on the part of the owner, Ginger Wall. Two years before, in 1998, in fact, Nan and Howard Scow, who made their, uh, had made their first gift to our fledgling capital drive, one that would be contingent on the purchase uh, of that, that land, uh, a gift that's now commemorated with the naming of the pond in their honor. When the, um, uh, when the master plan was announced, there was understandable concern on the part of the community given the special value placed on our undeveloped land by many in town. At first, there was public confusion as to where the future building on the campus might ever be, thinking buildings would be proposed on the, uh, on the top of, the, uh, of uh, Stone Hill in that great viewpoint. The current site of the Lunder Center being hard for people to uh, hard to communicate as a site for a future building because it was wooded and, and not really uh, accessible at that time. The confusion was followed, however, uh, uh, by a determined resistance for a proposed road to what is now the, the Lunder Center that was part of the plan, uh, and that resistance was to be felt as we continued the planning process. The Clark Board, however, had already demonstrated a determination to go forward with the project, buoyed as they were by the institution's recent programmatic success and the, um, maybe surprising for now, the optimistic national uh, northern Berkshire economy in the years prior to the dot-com market decline in the middle of the year 2000. 
While the Clark had no tradition of annual or capital fundraising, 1994-95 project, like all previous projects, having been fund, funded largely from the endowment, while the fledgling de development department was being established, no one really knew where capital would come from to complete any large project, although solicitations for support were beginning to be made. Indeed, towards the completion of the Cooper-Robertson plan, uh, the Institute was energized by a February 2000 announcement of a bequest from Libby Burroughs of $8 million. And with that encouragement, the Institute boards authorized um, me to search for an architect. And I traveled extensively to Europe, Asia, and around the United States. We see Stephen Hall's Chiasma Museum in Helsinki here, Raphael Maneo's Mon uh, Moderna Mosaic in Stockholm. Um, David Liebeskin's uh, Jewish Museum in Ber Berlin, to name just three of the 30 architects on uh, the Clark's original list. We finally requested submission of qualifications from 17 firms in October uh, 2000, in late, uh, to, to, to arrive in late October 2000. Central to my considerations as I traveled uh, were three distinct goals which I believe had to be demonstrated in an architect's work. First and foremost was the ability to, to, to integrate landscapes seamlessly and centrally into their work, given this Clark's special site. Secondly, they, uh, given the needed square footage for special, larger special exhibitions, as well as a new loading dock and visitor amenities, they would have to be adept at building underground with a record of bringing natural light to underground spaces, maintaining a goal uh, related to the intimacy of the Clark, uh, keeping the domestic scale, uh, give, uh, keep, keeping the scale above grade relatively small and given the domestic scale of uh, South Street. Ideally, one didn't want as large a scale facility as the 1973 building again. Um, uh, and thirdly, um, and hopefully, an architectural style that would not challenge the two already discordant neoclassical and brutalist buildings by introducing a third strong desired vocabulary. It was hoped, in fact, I hoped, in fact, that the new facility might integrate the two existing buildings with a third connecting one. Earlier on, in March 1999, in fact, uh, somewhat earlier, and while Machado and Silvetti were just beginning their work, and a year before any formal search for ar architects, I decided to stop in Japan on my way back from a donor visit in Asia to see my old friend and Harvard graduate school classmate, Utaka Mino, which, who was at the time the director of the Osaka Museum. As Mino had commissioned Tadeo Ando for the Japanese screen gallery when he was curator of Asian art at the Art Institute of Chicago, it was Ando's first public project in the States, we visited Ando's office and toured a few of his projects nearby, like the Church of the Light, extraordinary, the water temple at Onawaji Island. And I saw, and I saw then uh, the work being designed in his office at that moment, including St. Louis's uh, Pulitzer Art Center. Though the visits to Ando's buildings impressed me, I felt that uh, the Clark's project was going to be much too complicated programmatically for this special architect of light and intimate spaces. And I returned to the States thinking that he could one day design maybe a small open air pavilion or an amphitheater on the tranquil Clark campus when the hard work of realizing the master plan had been completed. In spite of these first thoughts, uh, as I traveled, I came to realize that um, at places like Ando's conference center at Vitra in, in, in Basel, which you see here, modest in scale above grade, but descending to an open courtyard space below grade, I began to realize that Ando met the working, uh, working with landscape, the underground with light, as well as the subtle architectural vocabulary desire that I, that I had more than any of the others being considered. Uh, I went back to Osaka shortly before the October 2000 architectural submissions were due, bringing an example of the Dakota granite of, the, of this building, the Clark's, Clark's uh, uh, Belusky building. As I, I asked Ando, famous for his use of concrete, would he be willing to try to incorporate this material into his building if he were to s be selected? I think this is a means of integrating uh, the existing buildings with the future one. Uh, he, he was surprised, shall we say. While, while, Ando, while Ando agreed, 
In the coming weeks, he began to have concerns related to his team's travel to a rural Massachusetts lo location. He faxed a letter, uh, you see it here in the yellows on, uh, on, on December 12th, a Tuesday in 2000, eliminating himself from the competition. It was only about six weeks before we were gonna have the, uh, the juries. Um, in a panic, I quickly called my friend Mino and he too was surprised. Uh, but he mentioned that Ando was leaving for New York in a few days to a meeting regarding a proposed rest, rest, restaurant project there. He was to arrive from Japan the next Sunday morning before his scheduled Monday morning meeting. Mino convinced him to be willing to detour to Williamstown for a few hours that Sunday if we provided a plane to bring him here, which was all confirmed in a letter faxed two days later. That letter's uh, confirming is two days after the first letter, which you see on the right. So Ando was at the Clark five days after we received that, received that first letter, and he quickly realized that the Clark's spectacular foot of Stone Hill setting um, represented considerable possibilities for his special architecture and landscape vision. He agreed to be interviewed by the nine-person selection committee of four staff, four trustees, and a professional architect that was scheduled uh, for late January 2001 in New York. Of the five firms we asked to present in that confidential process, uh, Ando was the unanimous choice. With Ando chosen, I finally started to recede, finally, in what was up to that time an overly singular engagement uh, as a project team began to be put in place. The team was led by, uh, in Williamstown, by the Clark's deputy director, Tony King, and soon was aided by Jennifer Ludwig and then Lisa Green. Um, the external group of consultants was, um, uh, was chosen in consultation with Leif Selkraig, head of the RISE Group, a Chicago-based owner's representative and project management firm. Leaf was to be essential to the team as chief representative to the board, especially because both the Clark's Buildings and Grounds Chair, George Kennedy, and Clark Board Chair, Peter Wilmot, um, uh, were Chicago residents, and later project meetings were often take, took place in Chicago. The other uh, consultants chosen would be larger in number than Ando was used to, and like Leaf, they hailed from outside the region. The New York office of Gensler uh, wanted to interview for the position as local architects of record, seeing an opportunity to expand their architectural practice in the process of becoming the largest architectural firm in the world as they are now. Ando was at first concerned about working in conjunction with a firm of such scale, but Matty Burke and David Adler, and you see them here in the lower left, their commitment to realizing Ando's work was to shield him often and successfully from the various cost and program al alteration issues the project would encounter at various points later. The Watertown near Boston-based landscape architects Reed Hildebrand, Gary Hildebrand, Becca Sturges, Eric Kramer, and others were chosen with Ando's consent after he and we interviewed a number of firms. While Ando had never worked with landscape architects before, he agreed in the Clark's case, given the now, after the acquisitions, almost 140 acres, uh, that, that we were gonna need to, to have landscape architects incorporated to realize uh, the Clark's master plan successfully. While we all knew it would be difficult to find contractors and subcontractors able and willing to work on a site three hours from Boston in New York and an hour east of Albany, and that and the innumerable other challenges were shouldered by Andy Bast and Marty Zubatkin of the New York City project management firm of Zubatkin Associates, who along with the essential on-site supervisors over the, uh, oversaw the work of first bar and bar for the Stone Hill, Hill for the Lunder Center and later Turner Construction for the rest of the project, both charged with meeting the demanding requirements of constructing Ando buildings, rural Williamstown, in, in a place like rural Williamstown with its uh, given Ando's exacting attention to detail and his special and quite hard to achieve use of architectural concrete. Often with Leif Selkraig and later with landscape architect Gary Hildebrand and facilitated in the Ando office by Kulipat Yandrasas, you see in yellow here on the right, uh, who was one of the Ando's assistants and the primary tra his primary translators at the time. Um, he's now a much commissioned architect based in Los Angeles and New York. Uh, I, I visited Japan once a month for half a year 
beginning in uh, September 2001, to, to develop the, the initial conceptual design. The earliest concept was um, finished in July 2002, uh, and though it was, uh, it was, it was never, never made public, and, and it was very ambitious. A two pavilion, uh, two story above grade structure that tied, uh, uh, that tried to incorporate the necessary and ideally north facing s square footage needs of the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. Uh, some of which uh, the supporting sp spaces that you see in the, this below grade level you see here. Uh, this early concept even included underground parking but below uh, on those uh, central water feature here, um, given here. But, uh, but it also, uh, uh, but the, given the fact that uh, Williamstown not inappropriately has, uh, is, is overseen by a, uh, a, its Natural Resources Conservation Commission that needed to, be, to permit all work, it became clear that the center couldn't, could not be incorporated into our plan, the, the conservation center, without in getting environmentally too close to the pond. You see the pond even edging on this uh, in the upper right. Uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, th therefore, the uh, process of finding a, a site for the conservation center became a challenge for, 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 for the next couple of years as, uh, as it became separate, separated from the, uh, the core uh, building uh, program. Um, and the needs, those needs would always often be called to, for, for this program, the, the enabling building because only after that could it be moved um, and the maintenance building torn down and the project enabled to go forward, that is enabled to make space for um, those water feature in, in, in the process. At, at the time, then and later, <laughs> I was being a pest, uh, as is otherwise called an involved client, even making marks on various early concepts. That's my, my writing and it's in the Clark files. Uh, you, you see, you see here, and I, got, I was getting excited after visiting one of Ando's most photographed projects, the Church on the Water in Hokkaido in, in northern Japan, absorbing as I did the magic of such a water feature at, at the Clark and imagining well, what it could be like. Ever, ever worried about function uh, as I was, I would even apologetically, but purposefully, bring pieces, little pieces of paper on trace paper to meetings with alternative designs for consideration, reflecting my concern for visitor and functional access, something Anda was not used to with his Japanese clients. And, uh, and in fact, he was always a little bit bored by thinking about program being a, the, the, the design visionary that he was. Uh, after almost two years of work, and now the somewhat smaller concept for the new Clark was presented to the public in May 2003 for, from this lectern. Underground parking had uh, beneath the water feature as well as a large amount of space planned for the conservation center had been eliminated and what would be a single though still two story above grade pavilion that rose next to a terrace on a footprint that replaced uh, the earlier idea and this is where the fir the, that first building would have been uh, now, uh, then in the concept and even now uh, a, a terrace. Um, it also had uh, on the upper level of uh, a full, uh, uh, it, 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 it had a courtyard I should say, you see that the courtyard is there, it was in the earliest design, but courtyard would open up, allowing the lower levels to have meeting rooms and event spaces for the Clark uses, as well as community. We're imagining a conference center for community and, and outside users, but potentially even being an in income source. Um, and as you see, uh, <laughs> we would never put it in now, uh, 21 years later, the possibility, uh, which we dreamed at that time of having skating uh, on the pond, uh, something that um, that was uh, that we wouldn't imagine now. Um, a new glass uh, entrance pavilion uh, was attached to the current rear of the marble uh, museum building, as it is now, as well as a seven-shape Dakota a wall of D Dakota granite um, that both divided the public spaces on the inside, while providing a shield to the newly created underground loading dock all the while visually and experientially tying the old and new buildings together from all angles. 
With the elimination of the space for, for, for the conservation center, a search began for the site for what, as I said, uh, was the, uh, uh, um, was the, at the time called the enabling building. G given that, that the community had, uh, had seen the Clark's up Upland site as both a, a park and non-developable woodland site, and I show you uh, the transition from Cooper Robertson plan on the right to Hondo's reconception on, on the left here. And given the various um, uh, all alternative sites that were being considered from neighboring Mass Mocha to certain greenfield locations uh, to the end, we're, we're, in the end we began working with plans associated with the then North Adams Regional Hospital's proposed expansion of Sweetwood and, and with the Clark wanting to be supportive of their expansion efforts on the designed uh, a conservation and visitor center Clark Greylock on a hillside location with a stunning view of the hopper between M Mount Greylock High School and Sweetwood in South Williamstown. Over time, resistance grew to this location, however, over the need to insert a water line into the town's infrastructure to provide water to allow the building to function. And it was a contentious period for the project with detail too complicated to express in this talk, but with uh, with the defeat of the proposed water line at a special town meeting in May 2004, the way was cleared for the Clark to build on its campus now that community resistance had been abated given the heated energy of the uh, water line uh, discussions. The first building on the uh, Clark campus, uh, now the Lunder Center at Stone Hill, uh, opened in the summer of 2008 and is a marvel of Ando design. Sketched on a napkin in a meeting with Ando in Japan in late 2004 with me and Clark trustee, uh, James Wood, the former director of the Art Institute of Chicago, who, who with my friend Mino had commissioned Ando for the Japanese screen gallery. It was the last of Ando's buildings planned for the Clark campus and the first to be built. With galleries imagined uh, as a chapel in the woods, appropriate for contemporary work that the Clark had never before been able to exhibit appropriately. It was far more than the enabling building than had been first assumed. Incorporating a seasonal cafe and orientation space linked to a broad terrace and expansive views to the Green Mountains of Vermont. Uh, at the same time, it provided um, uh, the Williamstown Art Cons Conservation Center with spectacular north-facing uh, uh, space that far exceeded their expectations when awarded the Kresge Foundation grant a decade earlier. With its opening in June 2010, public and, um, and critical confidence in Ando as the Institute Arch uh, Institute's architect of choice increased enormously, but that momentum would be hampered almost immediately uh, by the September 2008, uh, th three months later, stock market fall and the still remembered subsequent and dramatic uh, economic downturn. As I try to summarize the rest of the story of Ando's building at the Clark and keep this talk from getting any further in, in the weeds, I'll pivot a bit uh, as I start to conclude, but at the same time, uh, continue the story of the project's completion by focusing on the many reasons it took so long for the Clark project to be finished. First and foremost the, was the fundraising for an organization that had never done capital fundraising before. I mentioned this in spite of the fact that over time, beginning in the late 90s and proceeding in halting fashion uh, from then on, a development effort evolved and a development office was established. In due course, more and more people became engaged with the project and began to support with generous gifts but attracting and convincing donors is a long process. It takes time, especially um, uh, as we had the factors of both the dot-com and 2000 economic, uh, 2008 economic downturns uh, to deal with. And that latter one halted us in, the, in, in proceeding for many months. Of course, in July 2007, um, a year before the Lunder Center opening, uh, and uh, the subsequent 2008 market downturn, the Clark received the utterly transformative uh, cash gift of $50 million from the newly created Manton Foundation, accompanied by $40 million worth of works of art, the largest gift to an American art museum in that year, 2007. It was a gift absolutely essential to the realization of the project, 
but even this extraordinary contribution could not fully counter the concerns generated by the psychological and real effects of the 2008 downturn. It took, the time it took to realize a project was also the result of a variety of other factors. First, uh, the prolonged for search for uh, uh, the enabling building with a subsequent waterline controversy combined with the planning of how and when to tear down the maintenance building and when and how to construct the essential multi-purpose uh, mechanical underground service building including loading dock and underground kitchen of the project. Doing all of that while coordinating connecting systems as we plan for the renovation of two existing buildings as well as the new Clark's Center. And this had to be dressed while um, at the same time creating an environmentally sensitive landscape that included rainwater gathering and geothermal ambitions, all of being overseen by the Reed Hildebrand a landscape design firm. This was complicated and the schedule for completing the project had to be adjusted at various times to account for the possibility that the additional needed capital funds might not be secured. After the 2008 crisis and with Gensler's important help, the underground loading dock kitchen and mechanical equipment was conceived entirely as a separate building, um, one that could be uh, freestanding and phased separately from the public spaces of uh, Clark, uh, Clark Center if necessary uh, due to the challenge of funding, but one that would allow the old maintenance building to be torn down. And I should add here that the water feature which we now see is so central and essential, central and essential element uh, of the project was being discussed as either being in or out of the project until the very last minute uh, in the planning before uh, construction began. All along too, there was the time it took to reconsider the architectural program in the various design and so-called value engineering exercises that began with the co first cost analysis of the 2003 concept, each of which drew us back to, to the drawing board to refine the program to fit into the proposed budget limits. As part of the process of what so-called right-sizing the project to budget, the conference center idea, which regularly had to be rethought, was rethought from uh, different moments from 2003 to 2007. In, in uh, 2008, it was finally uh, decided to build just one above level uh, 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 Clark Center rather than two as it actually has been built. The con conference center ambition linked to the idea of meeting, event, and dining spaces were reconceived as temporary spaces in the West uh, Pavilion. Uh, exhibitions, yes, as you see in the upper right here, but also transformable, transformable, uh, transformable to event space or smaller meeting room spaces as well configured from sliding panels stored in the rear, still stored in the rear up there, um, of the rear of that, uh, of that West uh, Pavilion space. The short-term idea, a full restaurant with views to water became a hope for the future. And the short-term idea was maybe, uh, it might be located in the penthouse of the Manton Center, although under designed a dining and event space at the time overlooking the pond uh, which could be accessed from the Clark Center bookshop and built at some point in the future. Given all this change, uh, dissatisfaction approaching occasional conflict um, the, between architect and client began to mount. And it's even been memorialized in a film um, uh, available on Vimeo directed by Michael Blackwood who was commissioned by the Clark to archive the early project meetings. Ando is portrayed as the design visionary that he was and remained throughout the project, and I, the ever annoying voice for, for functioning program that might even be cost, cost effective. If there was any um, ongoing strain in our relationship, however, it seems to have sub subsided after I was commissioned by the Alphawood Foundation to write a book on Ando's public projects in the United States uh, that was published three years ago in a book that I've heard is in, in our shop. In the end, it has to be said, Ando's willingness to adapt to keep his concept alive was, was aligned with um, the patience and commitment of all the consultant staff and trustees to see the project completed and completed successfully. So, so much for the messiness of the process of the building, the messiness I warned you about at the start of this talk. 
The bottom line is that it is remarkable that in spite of the complicated nature of the Clark Project, on those core concept of a um, uh, course concept of a visitor exhibition and conference center cut by an angle seven wall and placed on a plaza overlooking a broad expanse of water nestled in within the Berkshire Hills appears seamlessly in experience as he, he originally intended. In the end, uh, the project accomplished important things for the future functioning of the visitor experience at, and functioning of the Clark. A conservation center with contemporary galleries, eloquent in design as it is, located on a new site on our campus. Uh, public spaces for visitor and program, especially the expansion of the special exhibition spaces. New underground uh, infrastructure from boiler to electro electrical equipment, to loading dock to kitchen and storage. The renovation of two uh, 50 and 75 year old buildings uh, and most importantly and hardest to achieve, the environmentally s sensitive water feature linked that ties to the campus together as it presents the hill beyond to museum and community visitors. As I regularly said at the time, it was a project as much about landscape reformation as about architectural expression, uh, something critics have not always appreciated as members of the public have. And in the process, the Clark also raised well over $100 million in capital funds for the $170 million project with a low interest loan covering the, the balance. But at the same time, it also established a new base of members and supporters uh, that continue to support the Clark to this day. In the end then, um, uh, and on the a 10 year reflection, um, I always like to, to remind myself, and I'm going to do it 10 years later, as, I've, as I said in the past at the time, that in the mid-19th century, the Berkshires had famously attracted trans transcendentalists, um, Emerson, Thoreau, Hawthorne, Melville, some coming to visit, others to spend years living in the area, many writing of their experiences of these hills and valleys. In this spirit, the, an, an architect linked to the values of Zen philosophy uh, reconceived the Clark campus as a place of repose, a site of reflection and contemplation. But it's also a site of social interaction and of fun. Um, it's a calming space that owes its special quality to Clark's vision in capturing the mood of this special landscape with an architecture that unifies while lending a humanity to the experience of interior and out outdoor spaces. It may not have the spectacular uh, views of Copenhagen's Louisiana Museum facing the Baltic. Uh, and you can't take a white bicycle through as the campus as you can at the Kroler Müller Museums. It's in a park in uh, the Netherlands, nor does it provide the gardens of the Huntington. But this new Clark has a different quality. A visitor experience captured on the edge of a terraced water feature that link to the views of Stone Hill views that have few parallels at any art museum anywhere. This is, for me, the project's most important achievement, uh, difficult to obtain, messy it was in the process, but seemingly effort, uh, effortless as the final result. And now, finally, as my last word, I remind you that institutions are never finished. The needs from the 1950s to the early 2000s that I've effortlessly <laughs> outlined here are not the needs of this moment. Uh, these earlier ones now resolved will be followed by, uh, by future ones, and I look forward to, to them uh, as the Clark continues to grow and evolve. I thank you for listening. It's a, um, it is tr tradition to answer a few questions. Um, uh, I don't know where Will is. Uh, is. Will, are you out there? Yeah, there? There are sometimes microphones. If we could have the lights up in case anyone wants to ask a question. We'll do it for about 10 or 15 minutes. We're not going to keep everyone from this nice Saturday afternoon and feel free, free to leave if you want. Uh, 
are there any, yeah, well, just shout. Anybody have a question? No, no questions. Uh, is, there a, is there somebody raising your hand over there? Anyway, stand up if, if you have a question. Um, oh, wait, wait here, here we go. Sorry, okay, Pam first, and will you hold that question and the, and the microphone will, will come to you in a second. Yeah, Pam, Pam, who's overseeing our next great project. <laughs> My, Michael, yeah, thank you so much for that uh, really exceptional walk through such a complicated process with terrific, terrific results. I wonder if you could say a bit, um, and no surprise that I'm asking this, about how you thought about the other museums in the area as you were doing this planning and thinking about the larger museum and arts ecosystem in the region. It's interesting that you ask. I mean, I was certainly thinking about, I, I link, the link, <laughs> the failed link to uh, the uh, North Adams Hospital was actually a, a support. We were trying to support them as we were trying to find a site. So there was a, a consciousness there. We certainly have always had um, ties to Masmoka. As you know, we even uh, gave them uh, $2 million in uh, at, during this time, I might add, uh, during their capital campaign when they were going through hard times in the middle of the first, uh, first decade, we were always a partner with, with Mass Mocha. We owned a building there for a long time. And the closeness with the College Museum ha has always existed, but it may not have been as, as, as primary uh, as was the link with Mass Mocha. But everybody always thought in unison about attracting people here, both in the college season and in the uh, summer season. So, so there was regular co co coordination there. And we look forward to further, I'm sure the Clark looks forward to f further co cooperation when your incredible new building is, is, is finished in a few years. Thank you, Pam Franks, who's the director of the Williams College Museum of Art. Yeah, question here. And I'm merely a member. If I know you're no longer the director, but from your experience here, what's the next thing that the Clark the, you know, it, it's not worth saying because it was so long ago. I mean, it's really, that was eight, nine years ago that we, uh, that this was, uh, 10 years ago, that this was finished. And there, I'm sure, I don't go to, uh, Liv and I have a great relationship, but, uh, but that's partly because I, I'm totally uninvolved. <laughs> right. well, when, you when you finished, was there an anything that you... Well, it was just that dining room. I mean, we, we still had that. Uh, there were a lot of people who complained blamed me actually. I think of Elizabeth Wilmers. God, she, she hated the, the result because we didn't have proper re, a proper residence re, restaurant overlooking the water. <laughs> she always demanded that and there were many reasons why we couldn't. There was a link between the kitchen and the West Pavilion. There was the money issue which I, which I mentioned. Um, and we went uh, in a you know, different direction. You know, it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, if we didn't have the 2008 financial downturn, we were so in the middle of the project, maybe the project could have been slightly b bigger, although I have to say, I prefer a single uh, level building as it was built rather than two levels. I, I think it would have been really t too big, but. But that, that goal of dining and events was you know, something then, and, and it could be uh, at some point in the future. But, but I'm sure there are many other things that uh, the Clark will, will uh, be thinking about as they plan, well, whether that's now or later, um, uh, because the, the, the organization has evolved, as it always did. I mean, one of the things you hear about in the story is that it was always changing. <laughs> And, and that will be the case, uh, and that's the case now. Any other questions? Uh, so then, Michael, um, so this is John Ackerley. Um, oh, okay. for, uh, uh, for the group, it could be interesting for you to explain what happened to the Clark Collection during all these uh, construction years, oh, and well, then yeah. how was that reciprocated in terms of... That was actually it, wonderful. Know, so, the, uh, so then expanding its presence yeah, yeah, and its... Yeah. A notoriety. Well, I think a lot, a lot of people remember this, but we did, um, in closing the white building in circa 2010, 11, we took the Clark masterpieces and you know, brought them around the world. That, that was a, certainly um, a, a wonderful gesture on our part and it made the Clark more well known in the various places it went to in Shanghai and 
um, Milan, um, the London, uh, in various places. Uh, yeah, and that was, uh, that was what we did with it. Uh, we, we got a few fees for that, but they didn't really uh, uh, compensate for the amount of work and effort it took for from our able registrars and staff to actually get those things uh, up and running and, and around the world during that two or three year period. Other questions? Yeah, Michael. Eric? Oh. Yeah, uh, Rick? Rick is, a, Rick is a former trustee. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see, because people will want to hear your talk. Is that, that microphone here? Oh, wait a second. Hold, Rick, hold, hold that question while the, the, the microphone is up there. But I, I want to hear your question, because it's going to be a good one, I, I know. I need, I need to hear Rick's question, but I'll pop one before. Yeah. What advice would you give to Pam, or any museum director, to reduce, to the extent possible, the messiness in... I've just listened to a podcast on the Big Dig. That was messy, you know, in your own house. But what, you know, things in your control, what, what do you, in retrospect, well, I think, uh, what might uh, be uh, You know, the College Museum is going to have the advantage of a clean slight, a clean site. It's going to be one, uh, the, the, it's going to say art to all people um, entering this so-called art, <laughs> art-centered uh, community in the, of the North Berkshires. But in fact, you can't see the Clark and Mass Mocha. You can't see very easily. But they, you will be able to see the, 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 the College Museum. And I think the, the, the problems that we had um, are probably not going to be as great. I, I, I certainly hope, though. We're not tearing down anything. We're not, it's just building with great people. And by the way, uh, the architect um, worked for a firm in Japan um, uh, at the time in 2000. Uh, and it's been great to meet to Florian again, he was he, he remembers my going to his the office of Sana in uh, in Tokyo when he worked there, and uh, and we he took me around uh, those, those those projects. But really, to answer your question, I I think uh, I've seen uh, uh, one one of Soil's building. It's utterly fantastic. I I just don't see this same level of of, of problem. Um, and you also have the, the, uh, the, the infrastructure of the college buildings and grounds, enormous infrastructure. They're so used to building <laughs> at the college. We weren't. <laughs> and, and that could be a negative, I suppose, too, but be, because they have an idea about building that the architects might not have. But anyway, we won't go there. That, that's probably the biggest challenge, how you, how you control your college buildings and ground staff and, and operations people who are used to building all the time when you have an architecturally significant project uh, that, the, uh, that not all college projects are. So there we are, enough of that. <laughs> Other qu question, is, is it now for Rick? Well, thank you, Michael. The, um, you, you told us a great deal about the difficulty of the planning and the revisions. You didn't talk at all about how difficult it was for Bar and Bar, the contractor, or Turner, I know. To, to meet on those uh, specifications for very high quality finishes yeah. in concrete. No, I, I, and you know, partly because I wasn't that, that close to it. Happily, I, I was uh, elsewhere, and I didn't have one line on it, but it's no, nowhere near enough because it was clearly one of the big issues. There were um, uh, there was poured concrete that was torn down. Uh, Anda would come and inspect. Uh, there, if, if it weren't for David uh, Adler, who, who uh, uh, of Gensler, who believed in uh, in creating a masterpiece Ando building, almost more than Ando did. Uh, as well as the various project overseers and, and Turner and Bar and Bar who are working re really hard on every detail. It, it, it could not have happened. I, what I might have said, and I think I'm glad you raised it, is that this clearly was one of the ch challenges that might not have been, uh, been emphasized enough in my talk. Uh, and, and it did have an effect, although not as gr great as an effect, as, as I've mentioned, on the, the speed at which, or the lack of speed, uh, of the um, uh, project itself. But thank you for raising it, Rick. It's important. <clears throat> Other ones? Yeah. Um, yeah. One striking impression I always get coming to the clerk is parking my car, seeing a very long blank wall yeah. that I yeah. walk along, and then I enter through these doors into this beautiful area and a beautiful view. And I'm wondering if this 
progression or this impression of passing through a blank exterior, so to speak, into an interior was ever explicitly part of the design? Of oh, it absolutely the was. It's, it's an ondo thing. <laughs> Frustrating, though, it is for visitors, including myself, who could come. Uh, to prepare you for, for the entrance and give you the, the pain, <laughs> pain of entering. So you, uh, we needed it, uh, the value in our particular case, which was not the case in Vitra in Basel, that a concrete building I showed you, which also had a, a similar long wall. Um, in our case, it hid the uh, loading dock because one of the real project challenges, pond, hill, narrowness of site, was to get an expansive loading dock into the site in almost the same place where all, all of the visitors were arriving. Ando might have done this on his own because of his architectural vocabulary, but we actually needed it <laughs> as a shield to the loading dock that couldn't have been placed anywhere else, <laughs> given the site. No, because it is, it is something that challenges the viewer, uh, the visitor, I think, entering, entering the clerk, to see the loading dock as part of the... Yeah, I know. It's. A, I mean, we. If, if you can think about it in light of the, the plans that I showed you, there's almost no other place for it, uh, how, uh, because we we were tight on on all of the other sides. So, with the man, uh, it being the new building being so far away from uh, from Manton, it could have been on that side. Anyway, million reasons why why this was a, an answer, a programmatic answer. Uh, but, but as I say, some version of difficulty of entrance would have probably been his preference as he prepared you for the experience of that water feature, which is something that you got at Hokkaido, which I was excited about in northern Japan, and which you get here, here at the Clark, obviously. Other ones? Okay, thank you so much for coming.